Hi, I'm Sunil Reggae, consultant psychiatrist. Welcome to Hub Bites. I've got my new scrubs on today and I thought I'd take you through a medical video. So what we're gonna talk about today is the medical evaluation in depression. Henry Miller, the neurologist, uh, said a very important thing a while ago. He said, the psychiatrist must be first and foremost and all the time a physician. In fact, psychiatry is neurology without physical signs and calls for diagnostic virtuosity of the highest order. The psychiatrist should not only first be a physician, but ideally a superlative physician. So the big question is, is a medical evaluation important? The authors have carried out, the authors Karani and Potocny, they carried out a review looking at 21 studies across different settings over a period of 45 years. And what they found was approximately half the patients suffered from significant physical illnesses. Of these, 58.2% were previously undiagnosed. So we're looking at a psychiatric patient population and undiagnosed physical illnesses. And a substantial proportion of the physical illnesses produced symptoms showing direct relation to the psychopathology of the patient. So a medical evaluation is really, really important in psychiatry. So let's get started with the key aspects of a medical evaluation. The first thing is pulse and blood pressure, vital signs. Now, blood pressure may be altered by certain psychotropic medications and of course anxiety. Now we know medications such as SNRIs that increase the levels of noradrenaline can raise blood pressure. For example, duloxetine, venlafaxine, desvenlafaxine, and milnasopram. However, hypertension itself is linked to vascular depression. And we know that vascular depression is a distinct entity which is associated with white matter hyperintensities in the brain and this entity is more likely to be resistant to usual forms of treatment. So it, it can result in a more severe form of depression. Next, pulse bradycardia can occur in hypothyroid states. Similarly, tachycardia can occur in hyperthyroid states. Tachycardia can also occur with anxiety. Next, let's look at metabolic aspects. Now, BMI and waist circumference are two important measurements to consider. This is not only to assess general cardiovascular health, but also we know that psychiatric medications, such as some antidepressants and some antipsychotics can result in metabolic dysfunction. So for example, antidepressants such as mirtazapine, which blocks the, anti, uh, the histamine receptor and also the 5-HT2C receptor, can increase appetite and can result in metabolic, metabolic dysfunction. Antipsychotics that are sometimes used as augmentation strategies in depression, so olanzapine, quetiapine, can increase weight gain and disturb the metabolic profile. Therefore, it's really important to look at these parameters as part of the overall treatment. Next, we look at examining the arms. And here we're looking at any IV needle marks or signs of self-harm so superficial cutting or even deep cuts next endocrine disorders the thing that's really important that's linked to depression uh, mood disorders in general is the thyroid now it's important to look at the neck and also examine it if there are certain signs and symptoms of hypo or hypothyroidism so you may actually find a goiter or hyper hypothyroid features or nodules on the thyroid and examining um, the thyroid is, is from the back and pal through palpation. We know that thyroid dysfunction is associated with lithium use. We also look for cushingoid features, excessive cortisol secretion, moon faces, truncal obesity, acne, and thin skin, so easy bruising. Addisonian features, hyperpigmentation of the buccal mucosa, sun exposed areas, and vitiligo. Menstrual irregularity is really important, so amenorrhea, dysmenorrhea can occur in thyroid dysfunction. And ask about prescription of the OC pill. We know that certain oral contraceptive pills are associated with mood disorders. Looking at the previous one, of course, it's not just the OC pill, but we also look at certain implants that can be associated with mood disorders. So hormones generally can be associated with mood disorders. So 
do think about that. Then we think about respiratory disorders. What's important here is obstructive sleep apnea. Now, obstructive sleep apnea can be considered as a vascular risk factor. When the brain goes through hypoxic spells or apneic spells through the night, it can, one can wake up with significant fatigue, but it can also lead to cognitive dysfunction. Restless leg syndrome can often be associated with depression. So sleep disorders and depression is an evaluation that one needs to consider. COPD uh, can result with hypoxia, again, uh, exacerbating mood disorders. And think about lung malignancy, rare, but certainly something to consider if there are certain signs and symptoms associated with weight loss, for example. Now, lung malignancy can present with paraneoplastic syndrome. So I, uh, in my practice, um, I've picked up a lung malignancy through hyponatremia, so paraneoplastic syndrome resulting in SIDH, um, where a chest x-ray then revealed a lung malignancy. Neurological disorders, so disorders directly affecting the brain from an organic perspective, from a structural perspective. Parkinsonism, we know that Parkinsonism, this, the basal ganglia is affected, so we're looking at the substantia nigra, but substantia nigra has connections to the frontal lobe. So Patients with Parkinson can present with depression with apathy. Similarly, we need to look at cerebrovascular um, risk factors, but also cerebrovascular events such as transient ischemic attacks or strokes in certain parts of the brain that can present with depression. Now, if someone has cardiovascular risk factors, it is likely that they also have cerebrovascular risk factors. So do examine them for motor or sensory deficits. Look for abnormal movements. So for example, dyskinesias, either due to side effects of the medication, say antipsychotic medications are more likely to result in tardive dyskinesia in affective syndromes. Similarly, Huntington's disease, for example, the initial presentation may be purely a psychiatric condition like depression. Multiple sclerosis, a young female presenting with depression with neurological abnormalities or optic neuritis or bladder involvement should raise the suspicion of multiple sclerosis unless proven otherwise. Then we look at organ insufficiency. So if they've got organ insufficiency, then depression can be worsened, but they're also more prone to things like delirium. So for example, if they've got jaundice, it might indicate liver dysfunction, hepatic encephalopathy, for example, due to alcohol misuse. We look at dialysis. If they're on dialysis, renal dysfunction. Um, look for peripheral edema as either signs of hyperproteinemia or as um, due to organ insufficiency in general. Full blood examination. Here there is some really, really key aspects we need to look at. So we know that psychotropic medications such as antipsychotics but also antidepressants can be associated with neutropenia and agranocytosis. Agranocytosis, we often tend to think about clozapine, which is prescribed in treatment resistant schizophrenia. However, in um, mood stabilizers such as carbamazepine uh, can be associated with agranocytosis. Furthermore, Antidepressants such as mirtazapine and miancerin can be associated with agranocytosis. Look for MCV because macrocytosis is seen in heavy drinkers uh, in approximately 20 to 30 percent in the community and 50 to 70 percent of hospital patients that um, use alcohol at heavy levels. Also look for vitamin B12 and folate deficiencies. We know that B12 and folate are cofactors in the metabolism of noradrenaline and dopamine. And noradrenaline and dopamine are very important for mood. So deficiencies of vitamin B12 and folate are risk factors for depression. We also know that antidepressants, antipsychotic medications can alter liver function, um, liver functions and urine um, and electrolytes, for example, urea and electrolytes, sorry. So it's important to look for LFTs and use and ease as well. Uh, for example, agamelatine, it's important to carry out regular blood tests of the liver functions at three, six, 12 and 24 weeks after initiation of agamelatine. But also liver dysfunction or renal dysfunction um, means that one has to adjust the doses as pharmacokinetic interactions become really, really important. Next. SSRIs or SNRIs and hyponatremia. This is very, very important as hyponatremia can result in um, seizures or confusion, delirium type episodes. SSRIs and SNRIs are particularly associated with um, hyponatremia due to syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, but it's also possible with the prescription of antipsychotic medication. The other important aspect is the gastrointestinal bleeding in the elderly, 
And this is because SSRIs or SNRIs inhibit platelet aggregation. SSRI is more likely to do so. Now one of the important things is the SIDH and hyponatremia is more likely in the elderly, however can occur in anyone with a predisposition. So prescription of diuretics, for example, uh, renal dysfunction, etc. Look also for isolated S elevation of gamma GT, GGT, which may suggest alcohol use, which we know it can exacerbate depression. GGT is elevated in 30 to 50% of heavy drinkers in the community and 50 to 80% of hospital patients. And finally, blood drug screening can also be carried out. It's important also to look at ECG abnormalities in depression because medications can affect the ECG. So some psychotropics are associated with the prolonged QTC interval. Upper limits are generally considered to be 430 to 450 in males and 450 to 470 in females. Anything about 500 milliseconds is really, really important to involve a cardiologist because it can result in torsade de point. So medications that can prolong QTC interval, we know that tricyclic antidepressants have strong anticholinergic effects and can be associated with arrhythmias, but also um, SNRIs uh, can be associated with prolonged QTC. Importantly, escitalopram and citalopram at higher doses, it's important to carry out a QTC prolongation, um, ECG, to look at the QTC interval. Uh, so doses of citalopram of above 40 milligrams, so 60 and 80 milligrams, or escitalopram above 20 milligrams, um, such as up to uh, 40 milligrams would be where I would carry out a QTC uh, interval ECG. Next, we look at urine. And here, we know that midstream urine for UTI is extremely important as UTI can be a mimic for a range of psychiatric disorders and a urine drug screen if you've got a suspicion for um, the, the drug misuse. So the take home message really is, as Plato said, the greatest mistake in the treatment of diseases is that there are physicians for the body and physicians for the soul, although the two can't be separated. And we know that when we think about the hierarchy, right at the top of the hierarchy is organic evaluation. So it's crucial that we rule out organic causes first before we move lower down the hierarchy. So I hope you found this video useful. Take care and stay safe.